All right. Well, let's get started. Kyle Kotz from Cost Brothers Lures. Uh, we haven't had you on for quite a while now. Yeah, it's been a while. And now we're actually on video. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How are things going at, at Cost Bros? Well, it's definitely a, a slower year. I think everybody in the industry is slower. Um, the month of September has been rather encouraging. Um, I think, you know, going through the slow season, you know, some diehard trappers, I think, never lose interest in trapping. They don't care about fishing. They don't care about turkey hunting. They're only focused on trapping. So you have that small half of 1% of the, of the trappers that, you know, they, they still order. They still participate throughout the year. Um, but this past spring, summer was definitely ra rather slow. I mean, I, I think I think interest is definitely down. Um, but here, probably in August, there was a few days in August where it's like, holy cow, it, it feels really busy. And then you go three or four days and it's like, I'll go work on my tree stand. I'll do this. Uh, you know, it just it's it's been kind of kind of up and down. However, September's been been you can tell people are starting to get interested again. So that's that's encouraging. Um, but we're, I mean, I guess I, I feel in the sense that we're lucky that we've, we've been around, been through slow years and busy years before, and, and we kind of have an established customer base. If I was just starting, starting out in business on a year like this, it would be next to impossible. I mean, it's just, it's, it's really a challenging time, I think. Um, and we'll see here how the next month goes as, actual trapping seasons open as to how uh, excited people are you know do we see them trap throughout the season or is it going to be the first trip to the fur buyer they're disappointed and they said we're done for this year uh so that's the other question you know you, you i can't i don't know the answer to and i i won't till we get there but it's uh i got a feeling it's going to be the man this really sucks i'm going to pull traps in and do something <laughs> else now um which I, I, yeah, we'll know when we get there because every, everybody's got a different, um, a different goal, a different perception, and it varies to where you're at in the country a little bit. So we'll see when we cross those bridges. So I remember a couple of years ago during COVID when everybody was kind of stuck at home, uh, the fur market was not doing very well, but you guys were selling a lot of trapping supplies, right? Yeah, so it, it's really fascinating when when you look back at it now. And I, I mean, we've all got opinions, and I've I've kind of come to the conclusion that you know I, I believe it was a a real illness, but I feel uh, we were. Oh, it's we a real still, illness. I got it Saturday, and I'm still yeah, hardly yeah the last right. Saturday, and it's and, been ten days, and I'm just yeah. finally getting over it. <laughs> uh huh. And and. You know, I'm, I'm very anti-modern medicine. I, I refuse to go to the doctor uh, under, there's two situations. If a bone is hanging out or if a baby is hanging out outside of that, <laughs> we're not going to the doctor. Um, but I, I believe it's a real thing. But, I, you know, the the closures and I, I'm not really a conspiracy theorist, but when it comes to this, I got a lot of questions that I just feel we won't ever get answers to. But with that being said, um, during COVID when people are at home, I think a lot of people are like, well, this sucks. I can't go to work, but I can still go outside. And, and so <laughs> you needed something to do. And, and you look at what happened during that time. And, and I, it, it did prove a little bit of that the trappers don't really care about the market because at that point um, with China being shut down, the, the, the supply chain of the fur business just was paused essentially. Yeah. And the bigger issue even at, with that was NAFA had just collapsed the year before. So we had this double edge, you know, we had, we had to overcome that fur that was sitting there and that big hit to the industry. We had to overcome that. And then it was just all paused and trappers didn't really care. Uh, they didn't, they couldn't go to work. And so they went and did what they wanted to. And during that time, also a lot of a lot of our sales were going to like uh, survivalists and um, yeah. people that were basically preparing for an all-out government collapse. Which that you know, again, that's a, a different subject, maybe. But we're happy to sell to whoever <laughs> we we don't yeah. discriminate. If you have money and you want to buy something, 
but you you knew great. this wasn't like long term sustainable business. No, I, and and maybe whenever it's really tricky because whenever business is good, it's hard to sometimes sit back and say it's too good. This can't last. And I've often told uh, told different people that you know the the time to expand your business is when you're really slow because you know you can afford it. Um, if you need to build a building, if you if you're going to buy out a business, you should base that on your lowest cash flow, your slowest time. Because what happens is if you start when you're extremely busy and you're at a peak, and you start to try to market heavy, expand, do different things, spend money, as soon as it starts to come back down to reality, you're done. And that's what happened in Napa. They're a prime example of of making that like cardinal mistake of expanding when things are good because it's really when cash flow especially if you're if you're using borrowed money um if you're going to take on debt and you do that at the peak when a, when a bank is looking at it and saying wow you're doing great you've got they love these, giving you money during yeah the we'll be happy to give you money to build a new building or to to you know buy out this company and then the next year they want to look at financials and they're like, well, your revenues are down by 40%. Um, we, we're we going to have, you know, we, we can't, we can't do so much for you now. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's, I maybe lucked into some good decisions and I've maybe learned from, from a lot of bad decisions in business, but the COVID thing was really, really tricky to kind of navigate because we uh, we had a heck of a time like selling snares, for example, and I was making them myself. And there was days, and it was like all at once we were, we were working seven days a week, and and you know we the idea of shutting down it's just me and Kellen. So technically, the communist state of Illinois they couldn't really <laughs> they couldn't really tell us to stop because we, well I was paying I paid a couple kids to stay home. And then, you know, naturally when it was like, I, I'm the kind of person, I don't want to get in trouble. Um, and so I generally tend to follow rules. And if, if I guess looking back, if I knew now what I, if I knew then what I know now, I would have maybe handled it differently and just ignored what the state was telling us and, and, and just, gone business as usual we had some part-time help and and i paid them to stay home and then when it was time to like the state was like well we can resume office work one of them was like well i got another job now and and, and it was right about that time then that it just really kind of took off and 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 business was just kind of kind of crazy and like i say a lot of it was survivalist not the traditional trapping market it wasn't the orders were not going to names we recognized. Um, and so yeah. the timing there was, was kind of, kind of tough. And it was, it was a good lear learning experience, I guess, uh, as far as handling a, a great rush of business. And there was a lot of shortages and, and people having a hard time getting things that I, I think now it's, it started to get s sorted out. Um, not so much that the supply chains and getting things imported is it any better, but the demand is such that it, it kind of overshadows if it takes longer for traps to get in country or something like that. It's not as noticeable as it was then when you basically had people banging down the door to get things. Did you find that you had to spend more of your time uh, explaining things and uh, products to to people who are ordering because they're less familiar with trapping? Um, a little bit. Uh, what we noticed, we, a lot of that influx of sales came through our eBay store more so than our website. And what we noticed then is, well, I can't set these one tens. Do they make a setter? Do people unfamiliar with how to use the product they're buying. And so that led to maybe not us explaining as much, but, people quick to say, well, I just want to return this. Uh, oh, so yeah. there's, there's a lot of like, we were, we were rather frustrated during that time. Kellen and I both, uh, it wasn't a lot of fun. Um, now the way business is, we like it, uh, because most of what we're dealing with is, is 
the traditional dealer network that we sell to the names, the orders, a lot of them are names we recognize people we were familiar with and, and people that, you know, they know how to use the products they're buying and it, the, the returns, the questions that, that really gets to be, and it sometimes makes business not so much fun. <laughs> yeah. And you shut down the eBay business, right? Um, no, we still, we still keep the eBay. Um, most of the eBay stores actually sports cards, which is just kind of a hobby of mine. Um, but it's, we still, we still have some traps, a few, we have books and DVDs, some stuff on there. Okay. Um, but it, it's eBay is interesting because it, it, uh, we sell a lot on eBay during the odd months, like March through July. And then as we get into fall and traditional business picks up, eBay generally sl- slows down until about Christmas. So, <clears throat> okay. So it, probably good to have something a, a little bump during those months. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. Now, a lot of people don't realize that Cots Bros is not just a retail trapping supply and lure business. You guys do a lot with, uh, a, a, as kind of a wholesaler to other lure makers and trapping supply companies, right? Yeah. And that, so, that yeah, that's, that's our business is probably hmm, 65 to 75% wholesale, private label, um, non retail, I would say. And is that giving you some insight into the state of the market? Is that consistent with with your retail sales, or what are you seeing in, on yeah, the wholesale side? Yeah, I, I, through. I mean, we we work with just about every every dealer you could name. Uh, there's there's just a couple that I I well maybe one or two that I've refused to work with, but um, but for the most part, I mean, I I I talk to 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 almost all the other trapping supply dealers, and and everybody's consistent. Um, I would say some are maybe a little bit busy because they are a little more aggressive with marketing or, or have new products or, or doing different things um, to kind of see a, a boost. But uh, that's, I guess, a new product or, or some additional marketing uh, doesn't necessarily change the state of the market. It just helps that particular business. And um, I would say everybody's consistent. Um you know, some dealers are probably being a little bit cautious with inventory. Um, others might be trying to say, well, if all at once um, steel becomes short again, I want to stock up on TS-85s or I want to stock up on a certain item. So we do see some of that where, where all at once you see a little bit of a, a boost because, and generally it's explainable. It's not because, oh my God, that item is really in demand. It's a dealer wanting to get ahead of something or they maybe have a little extra money they want to spend or extra space or, or something like that. Um, but yeah, I would, I would say, I would say every, every deal I talk to, if I look at our retail sales compared to the last year and I look at, you know, particular dealer sales this year to last year is very consistent that I, I think the industry is going to be down 20 to 30% from, from last year in supply sales. Yeah. And so um, it, one of the things that I've thought about a lot is, is how this fur market uh, influences trapping supply sales and, and trapping activity overall. And I go back and forth, you know, we know that a certain segment of trappers are going to go out there no matter what um, their effort might change depending on the state of the market. Uh, but there are other trappers that don't show up until you have a boom in the fur market. And I think it seems to me in particular in the Midwest with the raccoon market, because you guys have such a large percentage of the overall trapping community in North America that you might be a little more impacted by that. Oh yeah. So the bulk, you know, if you look at supply sales, I would say, um, I would say 60 to 70 percent are in 60 to 70 percent of the business is in an area from like Ohio to Iowa and Michigan, Wisconsin to Missouri, India, like that. Those states make up the bulk of the sales. And then, you know, the Northeast would be be secondary to that. Pennsylvania, New York on up um, 
to you in Maine. That that area would be secondary. And then the southeast and the west would be almost equal um, if you kind of divide, divided it out that way. And so when you look at that, naturally the raccoon is the, is the animal that really drives sales. And, and you hit it perfectly in that effort is what's affected by, by, uh, by the market more so than actual interest. Because for me personally, um, I'm going to, I'm going to set some traps every year. Um, am I going to drive 300 miles a day in Iowa trying to produce a huge amount of raccoon? I have zero interest in doing that. I can't afford that. Um, yeah. And it's not, I could, I could spend the ass money and do it, but after two weeks, the mountain of work I'm going to have here, the lack of time that I've spent with my family, all that stuff, it's just not worth it to me. Um, and, you know, then I analyze at what price would it be worth it to do that? And for me personally, there isn't a number because I've proven that I've done that before. It's not the same challenge as it was when I was 20 years old. Um, so I look at that and I think other trappers are that way too. Um, I think of a guy, he just placed an order, a tremendous raccoon trapper in Iowa, and he bought beaver traps. And last time I talked to him, because it's more enjoyable to him to float down the river and trap a few beaver than producing these hundreds and hundreds of coon that then he's got to process and sell at a level that's that's just not worth the time. Whereas beaver, he can get the same amount of enjoyment with it. Um, Grunwalds want the beaver. He gets the caster out of it, and he probably probably saves some beaver meat too. So, and it's not as stressful because at the end of the day, if he's catching nine or ten beaver versus you know a hundred coon a day, at the end of the day, he can spend an hour or two putting up skinning fur and be in the house, and it's enjoyable. Whereas if he's got a hundred coon, it's up until midnight, running freezers. What if it turns warm and I can't skin everything today? It, it, so there's just a shift in, in effort and in, in maybe interest too. But ultimately, I think the coon market is definitely what drives the bulk of the business because it, it does fluctuate heavy and it's the one item that, that really seems to always drive sales. So we should talk about the fur market. What's Kyle's take on where we're at in the market and what, what things are going to look like this season? So I figured I anticipated this question and this being part of it. And I, I text Guy Grunwald yesterday and uh, I said, how's, how's fur business? And he responded, bad. <laughs> and uh, uh, So one of the things I, 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 I try to talk to Guy fairly often and, and uh I'll uh, text them that similar question. And, and when things are good, he generally will call and we'll talk for 20 minutes. Yeah. And so, and, and, so and, I, and I for, a for a little context is, would you say he's the largest private buyer in, yeah, for a buyer in, in, the, in the world? The, Grenwald the world. is definitely okay. the, the largest uh, private wild fur buyer. Um, and, and I feel like between Guy and Bryce, they have a, a lot of, you know, they're talking to people in China daily and and in the last 20 years, um, I talked to different people, nothing against anybody else. But Guy is the one person that he has never been wrong. Um, he's maybe changed his mind as things develop, but he is he has been the most spot on reliable source of fur market information for me personally. And I think a lot of people. Um, so when i when i kind of i i would say i that's what i base the state of the fur market on is what guy is telling me and and you know when we look at these past couple fur harvester sales from a trapper's perspective they've been good um they and i i think that's help um but a lot of trappers don't realize that what happens at fur harvesters is only a small part of the overall fur market so just because fur harvesters has a great sale, it does not mean the fur market is great. It means that particular sale was good, the stars aligned. Um, so what are the expectations for this year? Um, I don't know. Um, a lot depends on, on factors out of our control. Um, you know, the, the old adage of supply and demand maybe is a bit 
of a cliche now because if you look at the market, um, you know, so I've heard Trevor say, well, it's all supply and demand. And it's like, not really, because if we look at, you know, if this, if the, if the demand is low, the supply should be increasing. And, you know, our supply of, of wild fur and ranch fur too, for that matter, is at all time lows. And so is the demand. So it comes back to like a chicken or the egg thing with this fur market of supply and demand. You know, what the supply is the supply going to reduce some more to where demand actually comes? Or is demand at some point going to come to where it brings supply back up? And I don't know if anybody knows the answer to that question. Uh, one of the problems is every so much of the fur market depends on China. And that's a real wild card. Um, you know, I don't really follow traditional news. I don't follow any news at all. I, 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 I look on, on X or formerly Twitter a little bit, but what I look on there is only things I care about. I'm not, I don't, I'm, I'm kind of sheltered from, from the world. And I like it that way because I, I just, it, I like to, the, my data space in my brain is kind of full. <laughs> I like it to be with things I actually care about. And, uh, so so I maybe am not the best person to analyze world events, but I do think that if we look at history and and I have heard driving in the skid loader, like the local radio runs through their news flash and they talk about COVID cases again. And that makes me think, well, uh, if China has any kind of shutdown again, you know, that could really be a, a, a dagger for us. Um, we need we need supply chains to stay open. I do know that um, we need to get fur manufacturers hands and manufacturers and retailers need, retailers need to be able to sell that fur. And we need to get to a stable place where that is happening for a period of time to where us as the producers are going to see a benefit. And I just don't know that that's coming this year yet. In, in China hasn't really even pulled out of their COVID lockdowns economically. I mean, from right, all, right. They don't they don't provide any accurate economic data no. outside the country. So we yeah. don't really know. But from all indicators, it looks like they're still struggling. Yeah. And that's that's just it. And I mean, we I was just before we got on, I was I was listening to a deal on YouTube, uh, a guy I follow on there talking about Tesla and the automobile market with the with the labor strikes and and the head of analysts and he said you know nobody can f afford a vehicle right now because of interest rates and now you have a labor strike where they're going to demand increased pay for workers so at the back end that goes on to the vehicle price so you yeah. take a, a vehicle nobody can afford and you make it more expensive you know that's a recipe for for uh going out of business essentially so when we look at that, there's so many factors like that that affect the fur bar market. And a lot of them, um, we as trappers don't maybe see like a guy Grunwall would who is talking right to the end user of the fur in China or other places. Um, so, you know, there's those, like you said, we don't know, you know, China doesn't tell us what they're, what they're doing or really even uh, report accurately on what has happened. Um, so it's it's really a, a tricky scenario and and i think it's a um a bit of a reset button has been pushed and you know how does the how does the fur market look when we do get to a point of acceleration again um i think uh i i think it'll look different than it has in the past and i also think you know for for decades we could always we could make we could make statements like you know when this happens this this will come next type scenarios that had yeah. repeated themselves for 30 or 40 years and i think now a lot of that is no longer relevant it's all changed and and that's that's really tricky i'm glad i'm not in the fur business or having to navigate uh fur inventory i feel like you know in the supply business um occasionally trap prices will come down but they're not going to come down by 90 percent you know, Duke Bridger, the, the 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 manufacturers at times have lowered prices, but for the most part, our inventory value is going to stay the same. Whereas uh, for any any 
fur buyer, you know, if they're if they're forced to sit on inventory, um, yeah. you know, if a coon goes from five dollars to three dollars, that's a huge hit, and they have to be able to absorb that. And I know um, over the last ten years, we dealt with a lot of smaller fur buyers that also sold supplies, and we don't hear from any of them anymore, which is sad because that's the the grassroots um, that really helps our industry when people can have a local fur buyer that they can sell stuff to any day of the week that that grassroots base of the fur industry is kind of gone um and that that that's a a sad situation but it's also the reality and i understand that um uh it's unfortunate a lot of those kind of fur buyers had mortgages and 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 borrowed money that they were putting into fur and then a lot of that fur was going to NAFA, NAFA collapsed, and it just killed their business. They're done. Uh, they're stuck with going back to work and debt from the failed business. So those people are not coming back in. And that's that's something that I don't I don't know how long it takes for the industry to overcome um, that situation. Well, and, and it's kind of a, it, it's sad to say, but it kind of is a dying industry when you look long term over the if you look at the peaks and valleys in the fur market over the decades, we do have highs. We have good many little periods of high fur prices, but they never reach the previous high. No. And so it's like, we're just constantly, if you adjust for inflation, especially we're we're just kind of in a slowly declining industry. Yeah. And, and it's, it's interesting. Um, and it's something the, it's like a, there's a separation there because, um, I, I, I feel strong about the future of fur, especially as there's more focus on on um, sustainable energy. And, and at some point, we're going to get to where people look at the stuff that we put on our bodies and what it's made out of. And when we get to that point, you know, fur is a very renewable resource and it's very sustainable. Um, so at some point, will fur and wool and cotton become part of the movement of being truly green? Um, you know, we do stand to benefit from that. Uh, but with that being said, that's a very positive thing. But then there's a separation of, of um, you know, labor costs and what a manufacturer puts into fur has steadily increased. And that's kind of pushed the fur market down. And, and to your point, like in 2013, we had we had highs. Coon were selling for, you know, 40, a lot of guys averaged 40 bucks for them, which is like, oh, my God, it's like a fur boom again. No, it's really not. Because if you factor into inflation in 2013 to match what the coon were bringing in like 78 or 79, the coon would have had to sell for two hundred dollars. Yeah. So we're only, you know, we're only a quarter of a way to matching that level. So it's exactly what you said. We've had peaks, but the peaks, um, when you factor in inflation and what the dollar's worth, the peaks have always been lower than the previous one, looking back to the 70s. With the exception of maybe we've had certain boosts like the Canada goose craze with the coyotes, where they yeah. did, with maybe did exceed those previous levels. But that comes back to, uh, um, uh, you know, is that a one-off type thing that that happened because there was one business driving the market? I think it was because look at the coyote market now after Canada Blues bailed on, yeah. on, on using coyotes. And, and you can look outside of fur to see similar commodity industries like uh, corn and soybeans, for instance. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at prices for farm uh, products, th those have gone down over time, inflation adjusted. The only difference is those, the farming industry has increased its productivity so dramatically that the yields are up and they can make up for the lower prices mm -hmm. with increased yields and more efficiency. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, but like you said, fur, fur manufacturing is so labor intensive and it, it seems like we're in a, a difficult position being such a small industry because how do you how do you increase efficiency to where you can compete with you know polyester products or other types right. of clothing well and, and you also have to look at too like like certain items like like the raccoon um if coon are going to average five dollars um you know 
let's look at like fur harvesters, for example. Um, they run a lot of routes, so there's overhead there to collect the fur. And then when it gets to fur harvesters, it doesn't just go to the auction. Um, you know, there's sizing and grading. There's people handling it. There's people putting it in lots. There's people preparing it for shipping. So there's labor costs all through that. And then, so on five dollars, uh, fur commit fur harvesters commission eleven percent. Let's say fifty cents just for round numbers. Can you do all that for fifty cents? Probably not. I mean, it's very difficult. So there's these challenges at every stage. Um, you know, a, a trap can a trapper produce a raccoon for five dollars? Sure. Um, you can keep costs low. You can trap out of a canoe. Um, I would say. 98% of trappers live in a rural area involved with agriculture where they can immediately go out and produce fur right around the house for very, very low overhead. However, at the end of the season, production is not going to be high if you're, if all of us are only doing that. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's really, it's really tough and, um, you know, at a $5 raccoon and, and $4 gas, when I was long lining Iowa and, and really that was my whole focus in life was producing raccoon in Iowa, um, gas was under $2. Um, I can remember driving 300 miles a day and, you know, $25 was about my gas bill. And I'd have <clears throat> possums and muskrats and mink <clears throat> every day would cover the gas. I could sell carcass, coon carcasses for a dollar. That would cover the gas. So I had all these, all these streams of revenue coming to me <clears throat> that more than covered the overhead before I even sold the first raccoon skin. So <clears throat> now that is just not there. There is a, and that's one thing in the Midwest. There is, there is a raccoon meat market, the skull market. You have all that, but the it's switched now you would look at it like can i catch enough fur to pay for the gas to be able to sell my skulls and my meat my cast or all this other stuff um so that's it's it's just it's a lot different and like i say we can't really compare it to what has happened what was happening you know 20 actually i feel really old because it was like 25 years ago when that was happening when i was doing that now um, so yeah, it's, it's, that's the, the big challenge too, is if, if all at once a Canada goose or something happens, uh, that there's a demand for an item, can we produce it at a cost that they still want it? That's the big question. I guess I wonder about when we get to that point. Yeah. And it's nice to see these $30 beaver averages, but really 30 dollars doesn't go that far these days it no it, it seems good because we're used to selling beavers for ten dollars fifteen dollars right. but yep. honestly if you look at even looking at a thirty dollar pelt even with caster and with with meat and so forth you you really can't long line beaver and make a bunch of money no no and i mean i just look at um this past spring i had to buy a new truck and like the cost of the vehicle um, because if you're going to produce fur, you can't do it in an economical vehicle. You have to have a truck that doesn't get good gas mileage. That's just the nature of the game we play. Um, and you look at 25 years ago, you could buy a truck for one or two thousand dollars, and it probably got 15 miles to the gallon, and you could run that truck for two or three seasons. A used, I mean, used trucks. I even maybe at the cap $3,500. Whereas now, now you're going to pay $30,000 for a used truck with the same condition and the same mileage, all things being equal. So how does that work out? Um, And, you know, the idea of being a full-time professional trapper, I think has been obsolete since the 70s probably. Yeah, Um, I don't like the word professional trapper because you can't be professional at something for just eight weeks um, unless those eight weeks you're playing football or doing something that is paying you an astronomical amount of money. And in trapping, you 
in the in let's say eight weeks, three months of trapping season, you cannot produce enough for to really sustain anything. Um, you couldn't do that in the late '90s or the early 2000s when gas prices and vehicles were more affordable. You definitely can't do it now. Um, so it's it's really it, it's a when you look at it, like you said, it's it's really kind of depressing to look at you know what where we were and where we're going. Um, I'm still optimistic because things can change, but it does seem like the challenges are, are really just kind of mounting more and more as we get further along uh, each season now, the past, basically since 2013, over the last 10 years, it seems rather evident. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it, I've struggled with it for years it is, you know, trying to be optimistic uh, uh, about the, the whole industry and trapping as a whole and, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's just a, just the nature of the game. A lot of things we look at in, in life are not going to stay the same. There's always going to be change and we just kind of, kind of have to accept it for what it is, I guess. Yeah. 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 So, um, so it, I guess the, the question I was going to ask you is like, how, how is interest in, in the podcasts? Um, how are downloads? Are, are they increasing compared to the past couple of years? Well, there, there's always a seasonal, you know, okay. trend to the podcast, of course. It's coming up right now be, because of the season. We're getting closer to trapping season, but it's pretty flatlined. Uh, the website and the podcast for like the last two mm-hmm. years has just been, if, yeah. you, if you average it out seasonally, it's just been steady. <laughs> yeah. Well, and like we, we've emailed, you know, I think I think it's 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 interesting because there is a bit of a, um, you know, people talk about scaling a business. And if we're, sell- if we're selling something like bread or, or something that every human needs, you can spend your whole career scaling and increasing and doing things, targeting new areas, uh, different clientele, doing things. In our industry, it does seem like, you know, scaling, there is a ceiling that yes. when you hit it, you're just stuck there, basically. And, and um, that's, that's why, of course, I went from weekly to monthly, you yeah. know, I started focusing more on the beef cattle on the farming side of things, because so like right now I'm at a stage where I could produce 40 or 50, uh, heavy feeder cattle for the market. I could produce 400 or 500 and get the same price or probably get a better price for my product. In, in, you know, 10x my plus my revenue. In the trapping podcast arena, I could do a podcast every single day for the next five years and probably I'd be higher than where I am, but I would not be much higher. Right? Well, yeah, and, and that's just it. You know, we're, and I think, I think this affects production of wild fur. We're at a yeah. point where, where, um, if you look at whatever interests, we all have different interests, you know, trapping's part of it for me personally, trapping's what I do every day. So when I pick up my phone, I'm generally not listening to, to trapping type content. Um, I, the past couple of years, I've kind of rejuvenated my childhood interest in collecting sports cards. Um, I, I listen to Dale Jr. Download and, and different NASCAR stuff. And when you start looking like, and I use YouTube basically for most of my content. There's not enough hours in the day to consume all the content that's created. And it's whether it's trapping or NASCAR or sports cards or on down the list, stock investing stuff. You could literally sit on your couch from the moment you wake up to the time you go to bed and consume content on that one subject all day long and not catch up to how much there is there. And yeah. so with that, it's like people are more distracted than ever. And it makes me sometimes wonder if that doesn't affect a certain group of trappers. Like they're distracted from actually trapping. Um, when I was trapping Iowa in 1998, 
I didn't have a cell phone on me. I had a digital camera. I had to go back to the truck to get to take a picture of an animal in a trap. And now we we're so addicted to our phones that I can't help but think that has to play an effect or has to come play a part in our ability to produce anything uh, as we move forward, because everybody's so distracted by this constant stream of content that really 98% of it we don't even need, <laughs> you know, it, it, and I, my, my daughters are, are seven and five. And it's funny how like explaining to them what it was like in the eighties when we were, when my wife and I were five or seven and what we did. And it's like, you know, we had to wait. If we wanted to watch something on TV, it came on one time a week. And that was it. We couldn't yep. watch. We couldn't watch G.I. Joe for 12 hours a day. We had to wait until it <laughs> came back around the next week. And so what did you do with your time between then as a kid? You went outside. And 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 so it's it's just it's it's a change. And, and I think that affects everything in that. We kind of have, as a society, we have to be productive at a certain point. And, and I mean, I realize a lot of people producing content is their job and they're good at it. And whatever the subject matter is, that is important. However, if nobody's doing the work to produce the cattle or produce the fur, produce, you know, we've got a lot of serious problems. <laughs> And the content game is difficult. Like you were in the content game, producing DVDs and, you know, trapping instructional videos and all that, you know, two decades ago mm -hmm. and people paid for stuff. And yeah. these days, everybody's used to anything electronic. They're used to having it for free. And so it's, right. it's a more difficult market to try to make a living at. And, and especially in our industry, because, you know, if, if we're, if we're making, you know, videos about stock investing or, or videos about something else, there's a lot of big sponsorship money. Whereas, yes. you know, in, in our industry, the sponsorship money is, is not enough for you to make a career out of producing trapping content. Um, the pockets are only so deep. The industry is kind of, kind of a niche, smaller uh, group of people. Um, so it's, it's really, it's really kind of challenging. Whereas, you know, 20 years ago when, when we didn't have the constant streaming online content, selling DVDs was a little bit easier because people people were interested in in trapping content at that point and they couldn't get it on social media nonstop because it was so it was still in its kind of infant stages um whereas now I, it, it amazes me that we we still sell dvds not like we did but there there yeah. still is a market for them um and that comes back to you know the time commitment to make a DVD, you go out, you make your DVD, you do some editing, bang, you're done. And it sells sometimes for years after that. Whereas creating content online in order to stay relevant in the, you know, if you're doing YouTube in order for the algorithm to pick you up, you got to be doing it every single day. And I don't have the time, you know, most trapping content creators also have other things to do so to be able to focus solely on that when you know if if you're doing you know in other industries where you could have a uh a, a, a mega million dollar contract sponsor to pay you to do the content it makes sense but in our industry you know a thousand dollars is not enough to invest that amount of time into into producing good content is really it's really tricky um so it's uh it's interesting you know one thing that is like trapping books to me books are not really i don't book, group books into the into the uh, youtube dvd content books seem to be their own thing and for, for some reason, people are still paying for books. It amazes yeah. me. I, yep. I, I pull up my Amazon app and the couple of books I have published there and I sell one or two a day just mm -hmm. consistently. Yeah. And I, everything, you know, everything else is like the magazine. I put a bunch of work into that. I put just as much work into that two issues of the magazine as I, as I, 
probably did in one of my books mm -hmm. and thousands of people tr looked at the magazine, but only a few dozen wanted to pay five bucks to yeah. for well, an electronic it, issue. And you know? I, I think part of the book thing is, is there are a lot of trappers that like to collect things and they collect yeah. books. Um, you know, collecting DVDs is not really a thing. Just like if you collected VHS tapes, well, you end up with a collection that is unplayable, uh, unusable, basically, because technology has 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 made it obsolete. Whereas a book, um, it's a book lasts, and books have kind of stood the test of time through all the different um, social interactions and media content that's been created over the past, you know centuries so from that aspect it does seem like uh, you know if you're going to spend time creating content and you want a long-term residual uh return i would write an at this point i would write another book instead of uh, producing another dvd or, or spending a lot of time on content with that being said i do have one idea that i've thought about i don't know if i will do it or not but i i uh I listened to Dale Jr. did a, a series called Becoming Earnhardt, and it was based on um, the 1979 NASCAR Winston Cup uh, season, which was his dad's rookie year. And he based this whole whole series on some scrapbooks that his his aunt had kept from that season. And it was just phenomenal for me. I, I enjoyed it immensely. Uh, he did a phenomenal job on it. And it got me to thinking a little bit like, man, I should dig through. And like I have, I've always kept journals and pretty good notes on the different trap lines. And I've thought about like going back to my early days of Iowa from 97 to 2001. And, and basically I don't have video footage, but I have tons of pictures and I have all my journals. I, I have records of what I caught each day. And I thought about doing like a, a little bit of a series based going back through that um, because I don't I can't write a book about that because it, it just wouldn't be the same. It would be something I have to talk about and, and show. I don't know if I will do that, but it's it's on the back of my mind um, to spend the time and and make like a five episode trap line anecdotes, Iowa road lining series. Yeah. And it, I, but like I say, the, that would be, that would be really cool. I think. Yeah. 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 And so it, like we, we did, we did a short version of that when you came on and talked about your different trap mm -hmm. lines a couple of years ago on the podcast, but you're, you're talking like in depth day to day. Yeah. Huh? Like, like yeah. probably about it would, it would have to be probably, like it would be like a 20 hour pro the way I look at it. If I, yeah. because when I look at those notes, the stories, it, it's like it all happened yesterday for a lot of it. And, and a lot of the people that I met trapping, um, I thought about like, man, if I could get some of them to, to like do a little bit of an interview, um, yeah. so, uh, unfortunately some of the, the some of the key people, um, one of the, the fur buyer friend that I sold a lot of Iowa fur to, he has passed away. Uh, a lot of the people aren't here that I would really want to talk to. My grandpa rode with like daily for all that. He passed away a few years ago. So it, unfortunately, to, to, to get some of those takes wouldn't be possible. But also there's a lot of stories I could tell about those people that I, it would be a lot of fun for me to put together. I don't know if anybody would find it interesting or not, but I would enjoy doing it. It's just a matter of, of making the time. And then is it really, is it really going to be, um, you know, what's the return? I don't know that I'd be looking for a return more or less. <laughs> hey, this is, this is just something I want to preserve more or less for my, for my own use. And, and maybe people will really like it. I think they would. Because there'd be some some fascinating stories there, um, and in a lot of names and different trappers that that people maybe have heard of, but never knew were significant to me personally. Um, so it'd be neat to kind of tell some of those some of those stories, and it just like I say, the time commitment. Because when you start looking at the notes, it's like, well, 
that's a 20 minute story to tell right there. And it's critical to how this season unfolded. So I, when that's the daunting thing is if I could do it in two hours, I do it. I probably do it this week, but, but to really, to really go through it all, it, it would, it would be a, a very, very big time commitment. I have a list of about five or six passion projects and that I've, mm-hmm. I've been thinking of, and they would each take probably 30 or 40 hours of time. Yeah. And I know that the odds of getting a return out of them are right. questionable. And yeah. that's the same thing. It's like, how do I allocate my time and, and, yeah. and, uh, and try to focus on, on something that's going to yeah. produce the most output? Right. And it's, to me, any creative outlet, it's not something like I can work. If it's a 20 hour project, I need to hammer out those 20 hours over the course of probably two or three days. I can't do one hour here and then next week do two because it, yeah. it never gets finished. And then yeah. I don't have the passion. Like if I'm in the mood to do that, I basically have to clear out my schedule. And that's only what I'm going to do. I'm going to clean up my office. I'm going to lay out them journals and I'm going to go for it. And I'm yeah. not doing anything else. Cause if I lose my, if something else comes up, it's like it's, it, it all ends. And I, I earlier on when, when, when I was younger, it was easier to do things because I didn't have a lot of orders. I didn't have a lot of pressure. I had a lot of free time. So if I wanted to write a book, I had nothing to interrupt me. I could just hammer it out. Whereas now, as soon as I start a project like that, I guarantee we'll get a hellacious big order. I'm going to have to put that aside. Something else is going to happen. And then it's it's difficult to get back to to the same mind state of mind of where you were when you started that to carry it out and actually produce it the way you wanted it to come out well we will keep an eye on the cotsbro's youtube channel to see <laughs> yeah. if it's coming out <laughs> yeah don't 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 hold your breath it might be a while but <laughs> and i also then i also think like you know some of this stuff maybe when i'm like semi-retired, maybe now is not the time, maybe when I'm 65, then I sit down and I do all of these stories. Um, I thought about, you know, the, the, uh, like the podcast thing is not something I really want to commit to, but then there's also like, man, if there's, there's so many people I would love to sit down and talk to and record it just based on the conversations I've had with that person privately uh, and there's, like I said, there's a lot of, a lot of stories. The trapper doesn't realize that there's friendships and, and thing, things that have happened to, to build different businesses that those stories, I think the, the diehard trapper that, that traps no matter whatever year, that's really, you know, goes to conventions, supports the organizations that is interested in the overall industry would find absolutely fascinating. Uh, to kind of see some of the behind the scenes things that have happened over the course of, um, you know, for me personally, going back to like 1995 is when I started in business and just in that time. And then even before then, it's it's I guess I've always been as fascinated in the business side and in the people side of the industry as much as the actual like trapping. And, and as time has gone on, I feel like like that the history and the stories that's more valuable to me than the profits or or the actual maybe even actually trapping yeah it is a unique business do do you picture yourself doing this for the next 20 years yeah i don't know what else i would do i i mean i i have other other interests um things things are intriguing to me but but i don't i don't i hate I don't see like being the idea of being retired. Um, I look at my grandpa lived to be 93 and a half and grandpa retired. And uh, he was a carpenter. He retired from being a carpenter, but then was busier doing carpentry after he retired probably than when he actually worked. And I do feel like, like staying busy, you know, his mind was sharp right up to the very end. Um, and, and I, I, I kind of feel that's, you know, I, I think 
I think I have to stay busy. I, I can't wake up in the morning and not know what to do. That that's like to me, that's a death sentence. That's horrible. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I mean, I have my routines, my things I do, and every morning I wake up and look forward to something, um, whether it's family stuff. Uh, you know, there, there's always something every day that I look forward to, and naturally, as as my girls get older and and I'm reach the stage of like when my parents are in their early seventies, then I see myself maybe pursuing more of these creative things again, like I did, you know, when I was editing the magazine and had time because right away when I have time, then I, I feel like my mind goes to these more passion project type things. Um, and so, you know, I wouldn't say I had ever necessarily thought about retiring, but I do, I do think more about getting older now than I did when I was 19 or 20. <laughs> yeah, we're at that stage. Um, wh- what are things, do you guys do things at Cotsboro's to, to keep things interesting, keep it from being so mundane, just, you know, day-to-day tasks? Um, we don't have a lot of day-to-day tasks. I mean, Kel and I joke around a lot, um, we tell a lot of stories, um, just, uh, Kellen has been listening to kill Tony comedy thing. So we talk about comedy a lot. That's something we're both kind of, kind of interested in. Um, but our, it's never really mundane. Um, we, it, it's, it's also different because like, like we each have our things we do every day. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes we actually do work together a little bit, but you know, Kellen does things like processing orders and I do, have other things I wake up and do to where we don't even see each other for a few hours um, yeah. while we're doing various projects and stuff. But I, I've never felt um, as far as being like mundane or repetitious when we had a lot of employees at times it was because you get into a stage, you know, when we had five employees um, you end up spending a lot of time managing people and trying to make sure everybody's productive and make the biggest thing was like, what am I going to have? I know this person's doing this tomorrow, but what are the other four going to do? Um, so that, that got, that gets to being a challenge, but when it's both Kellen and I, we don't have to like worry about, you know, what are, what are we going to do tomorrow? We both know what we can do. And if it's slow, we have a million things that seem to always need to be done. Um, so it, it, it's not, it's, it's just, it's really, uh, every day is different. And then naturally, as soon as we think about like, man, I want to get the freezer cleaned out, there's glands in there need to be ground. And then, you know, you wake up in the morning, we have like the biggest F and T order of the year will be there. So it's like, well, we'll just work on that. And, And so you just never know in five minutes, um, you know, like just today, it's like, ah, today's kind of an easy day. So you know, last week when we were talking, it's like, I know I got no semis Tuesday. I can do this. I got a chiropractor appointment. I can guarantee you today we'll have like four dealer orders come in. <laughs> it just, it just, anytime I, I do that, it, it just, uh, sometimes I try to do it on purpose <laughs> and then it worked, you know, like I'm going to plan to do this that doesn't really involve any work project because and then bang it it hits it's and 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 they get real busy so yeah yeah now you guys i would say you have the largest selection of lure making supplies of anybody in the country um how on earth do you source all that stuff and find all these rare hard to find ingredients well it's really it's deceptive it's not that terribly hard um There's a couple suppliers that that supply like almost all the essential oils. Um, And and so having relationships with those people are are, is really helpful. Um, Now, the trickier part, like the glands, the 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 raw meats, that stuff that that uh, that's really difficult because, um, you know, fewer trappers. Yeah, you're relying on a lot of different sources because all at once, if you know, if we run out of Bridger 110s, let's say, I can have a pallet of them probably in two days' time and do that whenever I need. It. You know, Minnesota Trapline has plenty of Bridger's traps. I can get them anytime I need them. 
But if we run out of skunk essence, I can't just go to another dealer and buy that. They might have a little bit, um, but uh, the same with you know fox glands. Mink glands is a real challenge. Bobcat glands, because there's so few being produced. So some of that stuff, you know, we're trying to stay two or three years ahead. And, you know, like if somebody had bobcat glands, I would never say, no, I'm not interested. I have to buy them because I don't know when I can get them again. Um, and we've let this past spring, I kind of pumped the brakes and, and I'm still doing that like on skunk essence because we had built up a pretty good inventory of a lot of the different raw materials. And uh, I, I get nervous because with interest, a lot of dealers aren't buying. And then, you know, if I'm paying $20 an ounce for skunk essence and I'm the only one buying it, and then all at once the price is 12 or 10, I don't want to still be paying $20 when it's available for 10. And that's what other dealers are paying for, paying for it. So I kind of, the like, that's a, it's a really tricky part of business um, because you don't, you don't want to be stuck with hundred dollar caster. And then all at once it's $20. Um, Which so happens. That, and, and I've been predicting that the past couple of years that it's not yeah. going to stay this high. Uh, so I didn't really buy any caster last spring. Um, I didn't sell any because we had a lot and I got a lot more invested in it, but, but I, I didn't want to like sell and then not be able to buy at all, which was kind of the, a fear there. Um, so Going back and to you your, kept your prices consistent. Like I bought caster from you over the last couple of years and I don't think the price has changed. So it's got to be hard for you to try. You've got to try to maintain consistent prices on the retail side. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, and, the, and it's really hard to change the retail side. Like if, um, because it, I don't know why it is, but like if something, if something's selling for $25 and then all at once our cost has gone up 40%, you can't raise it from 25 to 40. It, it, people won't buy it. It, it doesn't, it, it, it just, you can't, the retail side won't take that, that hit. It just won't sell. Um, so it's, it's, it's tricky to, to source some of that stuff and then actually maintain a decent profit margin when you do sell it. Um, yeah. You know, that's, that's a, that's a whole nother show almost to talk about that, but <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you guys have some new products in development or that are out for this season? Um, not really. We've had a couple, um, we've got through the course of time, we have so many different lure and bait formulas that were never really marketed. So like we, the past couple of years, it's worked out good. Like, um, one of them being straight mice, which is just a ground mice bait. Um, and it's something I produce all the mice. <laughs> Basically, we freeze them all year as I as I trap them around here and and uh, around the 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 chickens and stuff. It just it it seems like I always accumulate it. And then you know once once of early fall, late summer, Kellen's gone through and just jarred it all. We put it on the website as like a limited supply deal, and people seem to really like it. Um, it's fun for us too because it's it's we just. It's a like it's it's kind of a fun project because we just produce it. Whatever we have is what we have. We don't have to worry about sourcing anything when we run out. We run out, and the customer knows that's how it is. And and so <clears throat> that's been it's kind of fun to have some of that stuff. Um, and like our Kellen just did our Three Kings bait and we put that on the website. And and so um, we don't really we didn't really create any new products so to speak, um, uh, just a couple new limited supply type lures and baits. And, uh, we like doing that because there's not a huge marketing push with it. It's just kind of a, we can make a small batch with what we have when it's over, we'll revisit it next year. Um, and that's, that's kind of fun for us. And, and, and it's something we, we like, and it seems like the customers kind of like that too. Um, so, uh, outside of that, we're not really, making any pushes to, to come up with any great new big projects or, or new products. Um, not to say I'm not open to that, but I just don't know if now is the best time to, to invest in, in something new because the cost of marketing is the same as it ever was. 
and you're marketing to so fewer people. Um, yeah. So to, to really come out with a new successful product, it, it now would be a really tough time. And, and I guess I've got other enough daily stuff to do without adding something new, like you said, to put all that time. And at the end, the return is the same as it ever was. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yeah, having the limited run special products is probably a good idea because, you, like mm -hmm. you said, you don't have that inventory management, and it, people know upfront what what they're what they're what to expect. Yeah, yeah, and I and I think that's that's key. You know, people know, especially after going through 2020, 2021, where people didn't know what to expect. People like expectations now and knowing what they're getting, and hey, I can only get it for this time because. You know, for a while, they're like, I know with the TS-85, we were just back order and back order and back. We, we all, anytime we got, when they finished a run, they normally do like, like 20, 24 dozen at a time. And that makes a pallet. We get a pallet in it. And we went through a stage there where, where it was like, yep. You know, I would text Brent Swatsky and like, yep, we got the 24 dozen done. We got the 24 dozen in. Now we're only 16 dozen behind. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's really tough. And, and it's, it's tough for a customer too, because nobody wants to order anything that they don't know when they're going to get it. Um, so that's, that was a, a big challenge, I guess, for a couple of years that I, I feel like we're a little bit past it now. Yeah, there was, there was a lot, there was a lot during COVID that just, and, and the other thing that I noticed is like, for a while there, we were running specials like every podcast episode. You'd have some mm -hmm. sort of uh, a discount code and all that, and and that's seems like it's a lot harder to to maintain those too. Yeah, I, I we we've kind of I've also looked at just from a business standpoint, like doing coupon codes. A lot of people don't understand how to do it or something, and like if we run a coupon code. Kellen will get a ton of emails like I can't make it work and, and a lot of it's a lot of it's user error but if you just run a sale where something's ten dollars and now it's six it's very straightforward it's easier for people they don't yeah. have to do anything special at checkout and and uh, so we we've done some of that but it's also um it's there's it's really tough like in the spring we closed out a lot of snares and ran specials on those and that went well there's a lot of interest but it's really tough um a lot of the items we sell it, the margins are so slim that it's really like on some of the various traps oh, um, especially, yeah, yeah. and in and the one of the biggest challenges is like like shipping 110s you can ship them through the mail it's you, you're good we can ship them anywhere from maine to new mexico or any state in the country and come out fine but 330s like if you order a dozen 330s for from us today it's going to cost us about a hundred dollars to ship them to you and wow. it's 3690 shipping on the website so we're having to eat 70 dollars of shipping which you know it's it's a challenge but we've had orders and it just depends on the order in the state. And, you know, you get, a, it, it's really challenging because you get like a, a $500 order that goes in multiple boxes and it's going to somebody in Maine or Georgia outside of the Speedy, which Speedy delivery is a lot cheaper than UPS or the mail, but they only cover select few Midwest states. So you get outside of the Midwest and you get a nice big $500 order and, and, and it's tricky because the customers like, like, man, I gave them a five hundred dollar order and we appreciate it and everything, but we lost money because of the shipping. And yeah. so, how do you navigate? And, and I'm not saying we we lose money on many orders, but there's certain items that we have really analyzed and kind of gotten away from, like three thirty talls, uh, number six wire stretchers, things that are oversized and are a little bit lower profit. You almost can't sell them outside of of a face to face convention uh, customer pickup because you, the shipping on it, like it, it's, it's tough. And, and by the same token, how do you charge for that? Um, because you can't, you can't punish all of your customers for one customer that ordered uh, the, the, the deadly combo of 
number six wire stretchers, a dozen 330s and a dozen 330 talls where you lost money because that doesn't happen every day. But it's it's a challenge um, with because the shipping prices have really gotten astronomical and, you know, the margins on on the traps have stayed the same, essentially. So yeah. it's tough to then say, well, we're going to do a trap sale because you don't know who's going to order and, you know, to offer a 10 percent discount on 330s, you know, you're taking thirty dollars off of a three hundred dollar a dozen order, thirty dollars off. And now that leaves us maybe twenty five or thirty dollars profit on just those traps. And then we eat seventy dollars worth of shipping. <laughs> you like, can't just say, "Oh, if you live in Iowa, you can get the discount," but not. Yeah, Iowa. yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it, and that's that's not fair. So, and and then the other thing is, <clears throat> the way the market is right now, I honestly believe we could run a sale on our website that was was crazy, like forty percent off of traps. We probably wouldn't sell that many because they're just not. The, the interest isn't there. Sure, we would get a boost and we'd be busy for a couple of days, but uh, it, it's it's tough. Like you know, generally we try to do sales and specials on things that people hold valuable and really really want. And right now this year, I don't know if traps is that item. It seems like that you know most trappers have the traps they need for this year. You're just still going to buy lures and baits. They're going to need, you know, their cable cutters got dull, you know, the, the certain tools and stuff like that. But ultimately, a lot of our traps last a long, long time. A lot of the tools we use last a long, long time. You don't need a new sifter every year. Um, so, you know, it's there's a, a, a kind of fine line there sometimes of, of doing targeted marketing with what people actually want. Because if somebody doesn't want something, um, you can offer huge discounts and to the point of losing money on the item and you still won't sell it because they're just not interested in it at this time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, if you're discounting every week, um, people sometimes get used to that and say, I'm not going to order until they put a exactly. sale. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Yep. And, and we do see that. And that that's also tricky because like, like we've, we've Kellen and I've talked about like, man, we should do a special on this item. And then like two days before I, I've got it on my list. And then two days, somebody orders on the website and pays full price for it. And it's like, well, we're not going to then, you know, run some big special uh, or, or, you know, close out type deal after somebody that just, that's not, not really fair. Um, yeah. and, and we've done some stuff like that too. And then just refund that person to get them to the, to the special price. But, um, yeah, it's I've, I've kind of found, too, that like we're doing the email newsletter um, more so than doing sales or special, just doing it consistently, touching base with people kind of keeps it fresh in their mind. Um, yeah. and, and I think I've tried to do more of that just short, sweet. Hey, we've got this on the website and then follow it up because I've, I played around a little bit with, you know, scheduling newsletters. And, and I, for a while. I felt like sending a newsletter when people were at work was the best because they were distracted at work and doing online shopping. And now I'm starting to see that like Saturday evenings when people are kind of sitting down looking at their phone might be a better time to hit them with a, with a newsletter or, or, or special. Yeah. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What else you want to cover? Anything else? I don't know if we could talk a long time. I, you, you touched on my, the, the couple of things I had on my list. <laughs> yeah. Well, this, uh, I, I appreciate you coming on and catching up with us. This is great. Yeah. It's always fun to talk with you. And, uh, we're going to, we're going to hopefully look forward to, uh, a somewhat decent fur market and, yeah. uh, maybe some, something from the Kyle, from the Cots Bros YouTube channel on some reminiscence, <laughs> reminiscence yeah, one, the- one day, but you might be waiting 20 years. So don't- <laughs> yeah, all right. We will hold our breath. Yeah. All right. Kyle. Well, thanks. Thanks again. Yep. Thank you for uh, continuing to keep touch with us and uh, appreciate all that you do. Yeah. Maybe, maybe uh, like January after we get into the season, maybe we can revisit this or, or when we get closer to the, the fur harvester sale and we can kind of see what productions like there. 
it might be fun to kind of revisit some of what we're talking about now and see what interest is actually like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do yeah. it for sure. Yeah.